So our speaker today is uh, Jonathan Mace. Uh, Jonathan is a final year grad student at Brown University, where he works with Rodrigo Fonseca. He's an expert at uh, resource management, monitoring, and debugging large-scale distributed systems using tracing. Um, Jonathan's not a stranger to MSR. He's been here as an intern a couple of times and has some has had some very successful internships. Um, uh, we're we're inviting him here in a different capacity today, not as an intern, but uh, as a visiting speaker. So welcome once again to MSR, Jonathan. Thank you. All right. I, I did forget to mention that, right. So uh, Jonathan's, uh, 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 his work has received sort of the SOSP Best Paper Award. He's a recipient of the fellowship uh, uh, from Facebook, graduate fellowship from Facebook. So um, we're looking forward to hearing from, from you about your work. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, cool. So I'm going to assume there's a very um, uh, diverse group of people here, and uh, give you a sort of start by giving you a bit of an overview of the setting, and then I'll get into my uh, research. All right. So uh, as many of us know, distributed systems have sort of grown increasingly important with many aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. So this ranges from the everyday apps and websites that we visit. Um, to the useful features of our smartphone um, that rely on intensively trained machine learning models. Uh, it includes the smart devices that occupy our home, things like our Fitbit bracelet. And data-driven insights basically influence everything from what we're going to watch uh, on Netflix tonight to how our cities are being planned. So most systems today are distributed systems. And we are inexorably moving in this direction. But as important as they are, distributed systems are also much harder to reason about than uh, standalone software because they're much more complicated. So it's often hard to understand um, what a distributed system is actually doing, um, whether it's working well, and if there's anything that you can do to improve its operation. So my research aims to make some of these hard things easier. Uh, my goal is to give users and operators visibility into what their distributed systems are doing when they're run and control over how their systems behave. So to start with, I'm going to introduce uh, the specific kinds of systems that I'm talking about, uh, just to give us a flavor for this setting. So, uh, so I focus on cloud distributed systems. And this encompasses a range of things. But the important distinction that I want to draw uh, is that they are designed to run essentially on normal computer servers. I um, should have tailored this to my audience and, and swapped the Penguin for the Windows logo. I do apologize. But the point is that they are simply software running on a uh, standard Linux or Windows operating system on commodity hardware. <coughs> Sorry, there are only more to come. <laughs> <laughs> the main difference with software that you run on your laptop would be that um, we run many components of our distributed system on many machines. Um, and these, these components will communicate and coordinate over the network um, and orchestrate among themselves. So this is what comprises our distributed system, essentially. And this distributedness is uh, usually opaque to the users of the system because, uh, like with all other software, making it easy to use is very important. So just to give you uh, an example here, Let's take this standalone program, which just opens a local file and writes some data. This sort of thing might look uh, very familiar to many of you. Uh, and you can do much the same thing with a distributed file system, and the API looks almost identical. So to do this with the Hadoop distributed file system would look something like this. And the main difference is going to be what happens when you actually run the program. So instead of making local system calls, uh, our HDFS client library is going to contact and interact with the distributed system in order to uh, write the data. And this involves a little bit of legwork. So in HDFS, it'll involve contacting a master server that keeps track of the file system metadata. The master server will record the file creation and respond to the client. Uh, in that response, it will tell the client um, to contact one of several worker nodes which are responsible for act actually storing the data. The client will then contact the worker and send it the data. But of course, for redundancy, HDFS actually uh, includes multiple workers. Just in case uh, one of the workers goes down, it'll avoid data loss. Uh, each worker will store a copy of the data. And then they will respond back to the client um, with the confirmation. Finally, the client contacts the master one last time to mark the file as closed. 
So overall, this end-to-end -end execution is a little bit complicated. It, it, it required multiple network hops, and it contacted multiple processes and machines. Um, this complexity is uh, the price that we pay, but in return, we get some very powerful properties. So HDFS has a very high throughput and essentially unlimited capacity, and it can handle workloads from many users simultaneously. Now, of course, things don't always go smoothly when we run software of any kind. So let's suppose that we ran these two programs, and we found that they were just, say, super slow. So if this happened, what sort of thing could we do? So with a standalone program, there are lots of things that we can do. We can inspect the output of the program. We can attach profilers and debuggers. We can adjust the resources allocated to the program, uh, run it with different privileges, and so on. With any of these uh, tools, we would have complete visibility of the program and how it behaves. And this lets us get to the bottom of any problems that occur. But unfortunately, this is not the case for a distributed system. We could certainly try to use some of these tools. So we could inspect our local client, for example. But all we might see is that the client is waiting for a response from HDFS. So we could you know, peek inside one of the HDFS processes. But again, this might tell us nothing because it can only show us a narrow slice of that end-to-end -end execution. And at the same time, we would also have to disentangle the information that's relevant to our execution from the information from potentially many other executions from many other users. So just sort of stepping back, the actual dimension that we're looking for is what I call the cross-cutting dimension that's scoped to the processes and machines visited by the end-to-end -end execution and is also scoped to only the end-to-end -end execution. These typical tools don't do well in this setting because, because they are instead scoped to the per process or per machine dimension. Uh, this is what happens when you get too excited pressing the buttons on your screen. Um, there we go. All right. So they're scoped to, the, uh, not to a different dimension to what we're looking for. So we're going to get a sense of some of the difficulties here. Um, so now I'll throw another spanner in the works. So when we operate cloud systems, we don't just run with one system. We actually run many systems. So HBase, for example, is another popular system. It's a distributed database. And though it performs different work to HDFS, it does have a similar master worker distinction that HDFS has. So similarly, an API call to HBase, like reading a row from a table, will involve multiple hops to different components. But HBase uses HDFS to persist its data to take advantage of HDFS's useful properties. So a call to HBase may also indirectly access HDFS. And you can see that as we begin to layer these systems, we're also introducing more complexity to these end-to-end -end executions. So going one step further, we might choose to deploy MapReduce or Spark. Uh, these are processing frameworks that read and write data from these sources. Some of these systems will do work in parallel, not just sequentially. And then finally, as a side note for efficiency, it's common to run processes from many of these systems on the same physical machines in order to take advantage of um, complementary resource requirements. Uh, so this diagram illustrates the Hadoop um, ecosystem of open source distributed systems. So there's a wide range of different systems. They often perform similar tasks, but emphasize different points in the design space. And key to them is that they are designed to compose. And this wide range of interoperating systems has a uh, significant impact on our ability to understand what happens when we run them. OK, so taking a step back, my description has mostly focused on uh, data analytics. But my characterization of them rings true for other domains as well, including, say, the cloud services provided by people like Microsoft. Yay, they are on the slide. Excellent. Um, as well as uh, microservices environments, which are a common way to build modern web applications. Uh, they're used by companies like Facebook and Uber. Uh, for the talk, I'll stick to the context of data <coughs> analytics. Um, but what I present will apply to these other domains as well. OK, so at this point, we've built up the perspective 
that I have in my research. I'm oriented towards these end-to-end -end executions, and I'm interested in how systems behave from this cross-cutting perspective. Now, this is a problem that many in the systems community have thought about for the past decade or so. And today, uh, they've begun to incorporate distributed tracing into their systems. Now, distributed tracing is similar in many ways to just logging. Uh, it collects and records events across system components uh, in a way that we can then reconstruct some information about what happened during the execution after the fact. Now, distributed tracing represents what I call a first generation of uh, cross-cutting tools. They record and reconstruct visibility for after-the-fact analysis of executions. And that might just be human inspection, much like how you read the log output of a program. So in my research, I present a second generation of cross-cutting tools. These tools don't reconstruct this end-to-end -end context just for offline usage. Instead, they capture it and use it in real time to both understand the state of the system and then potentially to affect and change the system's behavior in response. Uh, so these tools enable global reasoning of executions across all layers and in-band enforcement of their behaviors, if desired. So I'm going to show two cross-cutting tools that I've developed in my research, one for capturing metrics and one for resource management. And I will begin with a tool called Pivot Tracing. OK, so Pivot Tracing is about aggregating statistics uh, from systems along this end-to-end cross-cutting dimension. The goal is to dynamically instrument st uh, systems to collect the statistics, but to group and filter those statistics based on arbitrary request properties, regardless of where in the end-to-end -end execution they come from. And I'll begin with an example. So let's imagine that we're operating a Hadoop deployment like what I've described with HDFS, HBase, and MapReduce. And let's say we have the following workloads. We have two clients that are directly interacting with HDFS, two HBase clients that are indirectly accessing HDFS, and two MapReduce jobs that are sorting data that resides in HDFS. In these systems today, how might we go about, say, monitoring the disk usage of these workloads? So HDFS is a reasonable place to start because it's a distributed file system, and uh, most of these uh, workloads are accessing the disk through HDFS. Conveniently, HDFS has this thing called data node metrics that already tracks the disk read and write throughput um, on each machine. So if you ran the setup that I described, as we did, you would be able to plot disk throughput grouped by machine over time, like this. But what if you now wanted to attribute disk consumption to the applications sitting on top of HDFS? Uh, that would look something like this. So HDFS can't actually do this today because data node metrics just doesn't provide this grouping and it also doesn't report disk consumption back to its direct clients. So you'd be out of luck. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we're going for with pivot tracing. But taking this an another step further, suppose you're actually interested in disk throughput grouped by the top level client applications like this. This is a particularly useful grouping because it tells you which users and workloads are ultimately the ones consuming the disk. But as with the previous graph, anything above uh, HDFS's direct clients is certainly going to be completely opaque to HDFS. But as before, this is the kind of grouping that we're going for with pivot tracing. So pivot tracing can, in fact, obtain these as well as essentially arbitrary metrics from uh, arbitrary points in the system. So there are sort of two important challenges at play here that pivot tracing addresses. The first is that distributed systems typically incorporate monitoring at development time. So develop developers decide a priori what they want to log and monitor. So when we later encounter a, a problem, the tools in place in our system often lack the information that we need to actually uh, diagnose the problem. And to make matters worse, although the distributed systems are inherently designed to compose, the monitoring tools in place today do not compose. So pivot tracing. Yes, Ganesh. A quick question. Uh, when you were explaining the cross-cutting tools second generation, you said one of the things was to get this data in real time. Yeah. In the HDFS example, say you got that data in real time. <laughs> Give like an example of what would you do instead of getting it, say, off of 
I certainly can. And that's the focus of the second tool, Retro, uh, which will come after pivot tracing. But essentially, if you have the ability to capture the metrics relevant to your problem, then you can immediately use that to do something like resource management. Um, so if you wanted to enforce priorities over who can use the disk, then this gives you the ability to capture the information you need to do that. Um, and it gives you that ability. I can come back to that. I will, I will come back to this later. So, um, so we can just defer it to Len. OK, so uh, given those challenges, pivot tracing combines two techniques. So we use dynamic instrumentation to defer until runtime our choices about what we want to monitor. And we use a generalized form of context propagation that we call baggage that lets us combine information from uh, at runtime from different points in the system along that cross-cutting dimension. <coughs> so we'll revisit baggage in just a moment. But first, I'm going to introduce the high-level lens through which uh, pivot tracing abstracts this task of system monitoring. So pivot tracing models events happening across our distributed system as tuples in a streaming distributed data set over which it can evaluate arbitrary relational queries. Um, so for example, we were looking at data node metrics in the earlier example. So with pivot tracing's perspective, each time an execution invokes this increment bytes red function, we uh, view it as conceptually producing a tuple that contains features of that invocation, such as the name of the function, the machine that it's on, the value of the delta variable, and so on. So using pivot tracing's query language, we can write this query to uh, get the data used by this earlier figure. This que query simply takes all the tuples produced by the increment bytes red function, groups them by the host name, and then sums up the delta variable. <coughs> if we wanted to run this query, pivot tracing would dynamically install the necessary instrumentation directly at the increment bytes red function. I'm going to use the term trace point to refer to these places in code where pivot tracing can add instrumentation. And trace points are essentially just references to locations in code. They're not actually baked into the system whatsoever. OK, so uh, key to pivot tracing is this ability to correlate across component boundaries. Um, and to do this, we introduce a query operator to let us express queries about that. So the happen before join is based on Lamport's happen before relation. And with it, we can join tuples that occur anywhere in the same execution um, from any component. So a query could essentially group and filter by properties in one part of the execution um, while summing up or aggregating uh, properties from elsewhere. So just going back to this example again, Earlier on, I showed the disk throughput grouped by top-level client application. So to produce this, uh, this data, we would take that data node metrics trace point, and we need to relate it to the originating client, pro uh, the initial, the, the originating client process that initiated the execution. So this comes from a different trace point from earlier in the execution called client protocols. So just to illustrate what would happen, Suppose a request first passes through the client protocol's trace point, uh, producing a tuple that contains, among other things, the client's name, hget. Then the execution continues and eventually passes through the data node metrics trace point, uh, producing, among other things, the value 10 for delta. These two invocations satisfy the happen before relation. So a happen before join between client protocols and data node metrics would combine them. So joining two trace points is pretty easy, uh, easily expressed with pivot tracing's query language. And then to finish this query to produce this figure, all we would need to do is group by the client protocol's name and then sum up the delta variable from data node metrics. So earlier I mentioned two key components that let pivot tracing evaluate these kinds of queries. And it's the second of these, pivot tracing's baggage abstraction, that enables pivot tracing to implement the happen before join. So baggage is very straightforward. It's just a generic key value container for tuple, uh, that can store tuples. And to evaluate a happen before join, pivot tracing will read and write tuples from baggage at various points in the execution. Um, OK, so baggage is propagated alongside executions. It's carried with the literal execution wherever it goes. 
It's included with um, remote procedure calls. It's stored in thread local variables. It's, um, it's copied and duplicated when executions uh, fan out. And it's recombined and the contents are merged when concurrent execution branches join. So just to give you an example of how baggage would work in the previous uh, query, essentially, when we hit the client protocol's trace point, we would put the name hget into the baggage. And then later on at data node metrics, we would just consult the baggage and pull out the uh, hget. That, uh, we can then combine that with the local value of the delta variable. This is essentially all there is to baggage. But it's what lets pivot tracing implement the happen before join, because baggage essentially follows the happen before relation while an execution runs. So with baggage to propagate tuples, and then a pivot tracing agent that's deployed in all the uh, system components, uh, pivot tracing can compile and install arbitrary cross-component queries at runtime. Um, so I'm just going to run through quickly the steps that are involved in um, installing a query, and then we'll uh, move on from pivot tracing. So as I mentioned, we have these trace points. They're arbitrary locations in the code that you can use to write queries. So referring to these trace points, uh, we write a query. And pivot tracing's query language is a simple relational query language, much like SQL or link. <coughs> After a user submits a query, Pivot tracing compiles it into what we call advice. This is an intermediate representation of the instrumentation that we have to install within system components. It has a simple set of operations that together are enough to um, evaluate happen before join queries. The final step is then a process called weaving, which is that pivot tracing simply sends the advice to the local components, and they dynamically install it at the requisite trace points. Once a query is installed, it will just begin generating and uh, collecting and generating tuples. So that's just a brief introduction to pivot tracing. The graphs that I showed earlier are examples of what pivot tracing can collect. And pivot tracing has very low overheads um, because it only collects statistics in response to a query once you actually ask for them. <coughs> so remember, it was pivot tracing. Sorry, not remember. It was pivot tracing's baggage that was um, sort of key to implementing these happen before join queries. This enabled us to pass information along that end-to-end -end execution and use it in later points. So um, I did uh, refer to pivot tracing earlier on in the talk as an example of one of these second generation cross-cutting tools. Um, and it can just group and join statistics arbitrarily at runtime based on the user's preferences. They can then be used for subsequent tasks like resource management, which is uh, what I'm going to get onto now. So I also argued that second generation cross. Yes, Ricardo. Could you? I, I'm still not clear on. Yeah, to that point there. Oh. This point. Yeah. So <coughs> the the installation of a trace point yes. is called weaving. Is it? Uh, we call it weaving, um, and this, uh, depending on how in tune with the programming languages community you are, this might be a abuse of terminology. Okay, but but what does that mean, sort of at a lower level? Is it that you specified that you want the trace point somewhere? Or actually, you, the way you specify this is by writing the query, right? And from the query, yeah, yeah. you figure out where to place the trace points, correct? So there would be a specification of what the trace point means as well that kind of is part of, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be part of the query, but there, would, there could either be explicitly uh, predefined trace points okay. that might be useful places in the system. Um, that would be similar to, say, how something like dtrace works, where you can have a very large number of pre-existing probes, and, um, and you could refer to any of them, even though until instrumentation is installed, they incur basically one instruction overhead. But, but the trace point is sort of predefined for the specific system you're tracing, right? So Let you would me... say, I would inject code into mm -hmm. this particular uh, class, or right? Yeah, so let's, say, let's step through how you might use this. So for the queries before, I identified the increment bytes red function as being particularly interesting. So I wrote um, the fully qualified class name and function name. 
um, which uniquely identifies the point in code uh, where I want to install things. In the case of Java, which is what we used here, they, there is a um, ability to essentially reload classes uh, at runtime. So our agent would rewrite the class to insert the instrumentation at that point and then reload it, which incurs a small overhead. So, um, so the, the tracing is not really fully dynamic, right? You, you have to sort of specify these entry points ahead of time and then uh, use them dynamically, correct? So it depends on what you mean by ahead of time because you don't have to specify them at uh, development time or build time or deploy deployment time. You only have to specify them before you write a query. So that could be 20 seconds before you install the query. Uh, but you do need to know what you want to refer to. Um, it's not like the system can intuit where this high level notion of a user actually right. comes from in the code. So this is not really for users to use. This is for the developers of the platform. I would posit it that it's for use by operators, people who right. understand the, the system um, and are actually responsible for running it. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and you said also that um, there was no overhead because mm -hmm. only when you actually run the query That's right. yeah. are the trace points injected and mm -hmm. the data collection take place. After your query has run, mm -hmm. that instrumentation stays there, correct or no? Um, so the instrumentation is ongoing, so you can install and uninstall queries. Okay. Um, when a query is installed, it doesn't pose overheads because when you reach the trace points, it needs to invoke the instrumentation. Um, but even then, those costs are essentially comparable to the costs of you know, manually having put that instrumentation there in the first place when you develop the system. Um, there are various, uh, I guess, uh, nuances that come with uh, overheads in dynamic systems like this. Um, I'd be happy to continue talking about them, or we could, um, we could save that for later. Uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll move on then. Um, okay, so uh, I'll have you know that this is, this is Keynote, not PowerPoint, which is why I'm having such trouble with it. Uh, okay, so I'm now gonna present a, uh, a second tool, um, and it's very different to pivot tracing. Uh, it's called Retro. And Retro, which stands for resource tracing, looks at computational resources along this cross-cutting dimension. So um, each process visited by our execution is going to expend resources, uh, like CPU, in order to do work. And if any one of these is slow, like maybe a slow disk on an HDFS worker, then that's going to impact our end-to-end -end performance. This problem is amplified because within each process, uh, we're going to be handling many concurrent executions. So congestion can occur within the processes on application level resources like locks and queues. So insufficient resource management leads to performance degradation for users, and it can even cause entire system outages. So an aggressive background task in uh, Azure Storage overloaded CPUs and caused a system outage. Similarly, um, an update to Visual Studio Online shifted a bottleneck to an unmanaged application level lock and again led to a system outage. And uh, so this isn't me just picking on Microsoft. Uh, all major cloud providers and internet companies have experienced outages like this due to insufficient resource management. Now this happens because traditionally resource management is addressed at the operating system or hypervisor level. But this only aligns with the per process or per machine or per thread dimension. And it cannot, it cannot distinguish between tenants within processes either. What we are really looking for here is the cross-cutting dimension. And Retro aligns with the cross-cutting dimension. It coordinates resources across all system processes and it handles both application level and hardware resources. So to illustrate some of the challenges involved, I'll show you a brief experiment with HDFS. So let's say we have a tenant reading data from HDFS, and this execution simply looks up the location of the data and then reads the data from the appropriate worker. So along the way, this execution will have to wait in a thread pool on the master. It will have to acquire a read lock to look up the location of the file, and then it will access the worker's disk in order to actually get the file's data. So let's run this tenant in a loop, making random eight kilobyte reads 
And I'm going to plot the execution latency of this tenant over time. And we can see here that there are three clear periods of elevated latency. And they correspond to the temporary arrival of three other aggressive workloads. These workloads congest the resources within HDFS and cause our tenant's end-to-end -end latency to increase. So the first of these is just making random four megabyte reads from HDFS. And this congests the workers, uh, the disks on the worker nodes. So this plot shows the average latency of disk operations on the workers. The increased disk op latency is what causes the elevated end-to-end -end latency. But the second workload is repeatedly listing file system directories. And this instead congests the master's thread pool, increasing queuing time and, again, impacting end-to-end -end latency. So finally, the third workload is a tenant repeatedly renaming files. This congests the um, master's read-write lock, because renaming requires an exclusive write lock to update the metadata. So this experiment sort of demonstrates how different workloads can interfere with each other in different ways. Uh, different resources can become bottlenecks, including both application level and hardware resources. Bottlenecks can appear anywhere on the end-to-end -end execution path, and they can change as the active workloads vary. So if we wanted to be able to provide some sort of uh, resource management or guarantee, maybe providing uh, no more than 200 millisecond request latency to our orange tenant, then we need to address all of those challenges. OK, so Retro does this with a real-time feedback loop of measurement and enforcement. Within all system processes, Retro measures the resources that uh, are being consumed by each tenant. Each second, these measurements are sent to a logically centralized controller that's responsible for making resource management decisions. This controller executes a resource management policy, uh, which decides how to allocate resources to tenants. The policy continually receives measurements, identifies congested resources, and then decides if it's necessary to throttle some tenants in order to alleviate congestion. Those throttling decisions are then communicated back to the system processes. So this runs continuously in a loop, reacting to changes in workflows and changing bottlenecks. So the goal of Retro's controller is to be a bit like a control plane for resource management that abstracts out the decision-making process for resources. So to that end, yes. I have trouble following why couldn't we have done this proactively as opposed to having to do it reactively? So all these policies that you had, you could mm -hmm. proactively have said, you know, tenants split resources or whatever. So certainly you could use um, sort of myopic schedulers, say, within each component that make local decisions. Um, I haven't included this in the slides, but in the paper we show that um, Individual decisions made within individual components don't necessarily combine to achieve the end-to-end -end, uh, like resource management goals that you might want. Um, so a, an assumption in this work is that you need global visibility of what's happening. Um, certainly that's the case with the typical approaches that people take today. So the typical ad hoc mechanisms that are included within standalone systems. Um, retro, though, is but one way you could approach this you could try to devise some sort of um, decentralized approach where the mechanisms that are embedded within each uh, part of your distributed system somehow can provably combine to provide end-to-end -end, uh, goals. And I think that that's work that, um, for example, Peter has looked at subsequent to Retro. But um, in this case, we wanted to just abstract out and see what we could do. Uh, does, that, does that sort of address what you're looking for? Um, I can justify it, but... Uh, So, given that our goal is to abstract out resources, <coughs> uh, Retro provides three main abstractions to make it easy to write policies. So the first of these abstractions is that at the system level, Retro needs to be able to, needs to, be able to identify uh, which tenant is currently executing in order to attribute resource consumption to tenants. And this, isn't, this is visibility that as I've explained previously, we don't have today. So first, to reason about tenants at this granularity, Retro introduces the workflow abstraction, 
a workflow corresponds to all executions from a single tenant over time. It's the unit of measurement, attribution, and enforcement in Retro. And uh, workflows align with that cross-cutting context that I described earlier. To actually get this context, uh, Retro has to propagate a workflow identifier at the application level alongside executions. Uh, this workflow identifier is a static identifier that follows executions in the same way that pivot tracing's baggage does. It has to be included with remote procedure calls. It has to be uh, stored somewhere while uh, a request executes. But using the workflow ID, Retro can then query for which tenant is currently executing and thereby attribute resources to tenants. So next, Retro introduces abstractions for reasoning about the diverse kinds of resources in our system. So instead of considering the complex characteristics of each resource, the abstraction only exposes two things. We want to identify which resources are overloaded at any point in time. And then we want to identify which tenants are responsible for the overload. Retro's resource abstraction captures this or captures the first order behavior of resources with two metrics. So slowdown is uh, simply to identify congestion on resources. It says, how slow is this resource <coughs> now compared to its uncontended performance? A slowdown of one means the resource is uncontended. Higher values of slowdown indicate uh, more contention. For example, for a queue, uh, slowdown will be proportional to the amount of time spent waiting in the queue. All we need from slowdown is to identify overload, not necessarily to be precise or to get an accurate model of individual resources. <coughs> so next, load attributes congestion to resources. Uh, load attributes congestion of resources to workflows. It helps us divide the consumption of resources among workflows to determine who is responsible for overload. So for a thread pool, the load would just be the execution time in the thread pool after you've uh, been dequeued. So finally, Retro's third abstraction is control points, which enforce resource management decisions. Control points are decoupled from resources, and their implementation can vary. It might simply be um, pausing a thread where it's OK to do so, um, or it could be interposing on queues in order to delay requests. Using control points, uh, policies can <coughs> throttle individual workflows um, in order to reduce their future load on resources that they consume. Okay, so using these three abstractions, workflows, resources, and control points, we can write resource management policies that run on Retro's centralized controller. These policies encode resource management logic without being tangled up in the implementation specifics of measurement or enforcement. Uh, retro po policies run in a continuous loop, reacting to per workflow resource measurements and deciding whether to rate limit any workflows. So I'm going to show you Retro's latency SLO policy, which is one of three example policies that we wrote and evaluated with Retro. Um, latency SLO provides an average latency guarantee to uh, one or more high priority workflows. So this guarantee might be, say, an average of 200 milliseconds per execution. Spare capacity can be used by other low priority workflows so long as the high priority workflows achieve their latency. Those low priority workflows will be throttled if they start to cause SLO violations. And the goal with this is to illustrate how Retro's abstractions can be used to achieve end-to-end uh, -end policies. We presented other policies in the paper that achieve other things. OK, so I'm going to step through the code of the policy. Uh, but first, I'm going to um, just give a quick high-level description. So the policy runs in a loop. Each iteration, it begins by selecting one of the high-priority workflows, which I'll refer to as W. W is just whoever is furthest from achieving the latency goal or closest to violating it. The policy next looks at each of the low-priority workflows and for each of them determines how much does this interfere with W? We calculate interference by finding the resources that both workflows consume and then considering how congested are those resources. <coughs> Using interference, we arrive at a weight uh, for each low priority workflow based on how much interference they cause. 
and we use those weights to throttle the low priority workflows. Um, that's it for the policy. This just runs continuously in a loop, making small incremental changes each time. So I'm going to uncover the code and step through it. Uh, so to begin with, W is just the high priority workflow with the highest ratio of current latency to promised latency. Next, to calculate interference, we first calculate the importance of each resource by looking at the slowdown of the resource and combining it with the amount of time the high priority workflow spends consuming it. Importance sort of represents the amount of latency that can be reclaimed uh, by the high priority workflow on the resource. So we then calculate low priority interference by combining resource importance with the load of each low priority workflow on the resource. After normalizing the interference, we calculate a scale factor for each low priority workflow. We use that to adjust the control point rates. If W is exceeding its target, then we throttle the low priority workflows based on the calculated interference. Or if all high priority workflows are getting their, uh, their promised latency, we relax the low priority workflows so that they can utilize spare capacity. Finally, the policy sends out the control point rates. So these parameters, alpha and beta, uh, control the size of steps taken each iteration. Great, so we made it through the policy. Now I can show you an experiment that uh, we ran using this policy with clients to HDFS and HBase. So we have three high priority workflows. We have an HDFS client making eight kilobyte random reads. We have an HBase cl client that is reading rows at random from a large on-disk database table. And we have an HBase client that is reading rows from a database table that HBase has cached in memory, so it doesn't require an HDFS lookup. So we're also going to run three low priority workflows. We've got an HBase client that's scanning a large on-disk database table. We have an HDFS client making directories. And we have an HBase client that's uh, scanning tables HBase has cached in memory. So again, doesn't require contacting HDFS. So I'm going to plot the latency over time of the high priority workflows. And then we'll compare what happens with and without the policy running. Um, an added twist is that uh, I'll temporarily make each low priority uh, workflow more aggressive. And just to clarify this figure, instead of directly plotting latency, the y-axis is normalized with respect to the SLOs of the high priority workflows. So um, a value above one is bad. It means you're missing your, your latency. So first, we'll just look at the baseline latency for read 8K. Uh, this is with retro not enabled. So read 8K's latency is impacted by the table scan, but it's more impacted by the client that's making directories. This causes an SLO violation of about 10x. And um, finally, the cache table scan basically has no impact on read 8K. To see where the increased latency comes from, I'll plot the slowdown of some resources. So remember that a slowdown of one means uncontended, and higher values indicate more contention. So the table scan causes slowdown on HDFS's disks, contributing to read 8K's increased latency. Then the make.dir client increases queuing time at the HDFS master server, also impacting read 8K. So now moving on to the next high priority workflow, read one row, uh, it too suffers from the discontention caused by the table scan. And it's significantly impacted by the cached table scan, again, seeing about a 10x SLO violation. This occurs because the cached table scan um, causes both increased CPU slowdown and increases queuing time at the HBase workers. So moving on to the third high priority workflow, uh, read one cached row, it's only really affected by the cached table scan. Uh, this is because reading one cached row is a fast in-memory lookup that's easily impacted by slowdown on uh, CPU and on the uh, HBase worker queues. So overall, we have different bottlenecks flaring up uh, depending on the workloads present. And each time, it's affecting a different high priority workflow. OK, so we repeat this experiment with retro enabled and running the latency SLO policy. I'm going to plot the new latencies here. 
So we'll actually look at read one row first. Uh, it's the high priority workflow that is most affected by the table scan. And with retro enabled, read one row's latency still increases, but it doesn't exceed that SLO target. <coughs> Similarly, read one cached row is still affected by the cache table scan. But again, the latency stabilizes around the SLO target. And finally, we see the same effect for read 8K, remaining around the SLO target when the MakeDo workflow flares up. So overall, each time one of the low priority workflows flares up, the policy will identify the offending workflow and throttle it in order to maintain the high priority latencies. The policy itself does this using only retro's abstractions, agnostic to the underlying resource implementations and control points. Um, OK, so just to sort of summarize. Yes? Sorry. Do you think that those figures would depend on how you define the SLOs? Like if, if the SLO was tighter from the beginning, right, <laughs> you could have totally missed it, right? So how do you de decide what should be correct SLO for each workflow? I think the distinguishing thing here would be whether the system itself can fulfill all the SLOs that you start with and whether you have spare capacity in the first place. Um, you probably could write a policy that, behave, that then behaves correctly if all SLOs are missed. Um, we actually did implement a, um, both a bottleneck resource fairness policy and a dominant resource fairness policy. Um, so below that, we would be able to revert to that behavior. Um, I guess the sort of purpose here is a demonstration that these abstractions are sort of good enough for implementing a relatively diverse range of different policies. Um, yeah, a similar, a similar sort of case would be if one of the high priority workflows was itself very aggressive and was responsible for causing, um, causing slowdown for the other high priority workflows. So I have another question also, because here we have a feedback loop, right? Yeah. Um, there is some delay. Mm -hmm. So if you have workflows that are changing very quickly, yeah and your delay is noticeable, then you're going to have, you might get into this bad situation, right? Yep. It's very unstable. So what is, have you looked at that, that limits also? Like what's the yes. resolution? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as a hypothetical situation, this is true. And if we encountered such work, uh, workloads, then we would oscillate between, um, sort of between iterations of the loop. But um, in practice, we just didn't observe this. Um, either we would have something like a MapReduce job where the resource requirements changed at a very coarse granularity, or we would have workloads that were composed of several different API calls, each one having different resource demands, but the aggregate resource consumption was uh, relatively stable, in which case all the API calls would be throttled, even the ones that weren't uh, interfering with the high priority workflows, but that's okay to us at least because that's the granularity at which we decided to um, enforce these goals. Um, in some later work, we actually did look at workloads to Azure Storage, for example, and we kind of observed, observed what I just said. Well, not kind of, we did observe what I just said. Um, the workloads are very repetitive. Um, there are compositions of different kinds of API calls, but you can do a very good job of predicting the future requirements based on a s sort of s recent past, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand the sort of what what are the limitations of the approach here, right? Uh, if I understood correctly, um, your policies can affect the use of certain resources that are like software visible, right? Yeah, yeah. Like locks yeah. and things that produce queues and so forth, yeah, so you yeah. can give priority to mm -hmm. some users of them mm -hmm. uh, rather than others. So that's one thing. Uh, how do you handle situations like uh, you have HDFS as an example here where you have multiple users that when they're running alone, they produce a sequential access stream to the, yeah, the yeah. disks. But when they're combined, even if they both are high priority, mm -hmm. they're going to randomize the accesses. Yep. How, how do you handle that situation? Uh, yes, yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, we handled this by simply stepping up an order of magnitude or two in terms of control. So if, well, if there are two high priority workflows accessing the disk and their access patterns are such that it causes the disk throughput to just collapse, then um, if they're both high priority, we don't do anything to do with that. We just accept that because that's the way the system would behave without us there. Um, but throttling specifically does have, does interfere with lower level resource, uh, like resource management 
policies, essentially. So like if you had a low priority tenant accessing the disk and you were aggressively throttling it, all the work that the operating sy system and the disk itself do to like, read ahead, for example, would be wasted because that data would be sitting in memory, right. yet by the time you come to access it, it will have gone. But, but in that context, how would you determine that this is actually happening? Because there's no user, user space queue that yeah. you can well, we, sort of mess we with. Well, we basically it. don't. Um, we implement, con like we just say control points have to be at a, at a coarse granularity. If your control point is trying to throttle a request every 10 milliseconds, that's a little bit too coarse. But if it's every 500 milliseconds to one second, that's far more um, appropriate because that gives the operating system sort of wiggle room to do its thing. Um, but this is why Retro's policies therefore only converge over a matter of seconds rather than potentially milliseconds. And this is, this is one of the main, I guess, limitations of taking an entirely application level approach. So, so in your case, you would be able to do the control at a coarser grain, yeah. coarse time granularity. Yeah. But at which point? If there's no queue, mm -hmm. you see what I mean? If there's no queue that you can reorder requests, where would that point be? Ah, okay. So, um, so there are two main choices we have. We either have sleeping of threads, so the the execution will en will enter the control point um, at a reasonable rate, and that has to be at a sufficient that has to be sufficiently regular for us to actually be able to stop. Them stop them. That's chosen by the system instrumenter. Uh, this person has to figure out where is appropriate and where is not appropriate to have a control point because you don't want to put it inside when you have acquired some locks or something like that. Um, but then one, even if it is a little <coughs> bit invoked a little bit too frequently, the control point itself um, can decide not to make decisions if it made a decision recently. So it can just like, let you pass until a certain amount of time has elapsed. Um, and that worked that worked pretty well for our experiments. Um, but actually, uh, this, is, this is a great point. Um, the immediate next steps that I would have liked to take from a sort of personal satisfaction standpoint would have been to push some of these ideas down into the operating system in order to like, tighten up the convergence rates and um, avoid some of these conflicts that make. I and mean, it's very unsatisfying to rely on um, sort of periodicity of workloads and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I think this is a good first step. All right. So, um, so one of the key pieces that I just wanted to take away from Retro is that this workflow ID propagation is the piece that gave us the visibility of which tenants were consuming resources and let us do the coordinating, coordinated throttling of tenants. Without the workflow ID, we would not have been able to do that. And when we step back a level further and look at retro and pivot tracing side by side, we can see that they tackle quite different topics. Retro is about resource management policies, whereas pivot tracing is about querying metrics uh, from systems. Yet both of these tools operate in that cross-cutting dimension, and they consider end-to-end -end executions. And I had characterized these as a second generation of cross-cutting tools, the key advance being that they gain immediate visibility of the cross-system context at runtime during executions. They can then use that context to make immediate decisions and uh, make decisions about any further information they might need to communicate to later components. So beyond retro and pivot tracing, we can kind of imagine um, other kinds of cross-cutting tools for distributed systems for a range of different tasks. So, like, take security, for example. It's hard to reason about security coherently end-to-end -end across components. So, how might we make sure that two components do not interact with one another through any level of indirection? This is particularly difficult in the kind of microservices uh, deployments uh, that I mentioned at the start of the talk. A very different use case would be chaos engineering. Uh, does the system behave correctly when specific parts of it fail? So at Uber, for example, they've deployed uh, this baggage concept and experimented with using it to carry chaos engineering directives um, so that we can trigger failures in any component of our system and target those components and do so safely alongside production traffic. Um, 
A third, and again, very different use case, is verifying consistency in distributed systems. Many systems have replication in them, much like HDFS at the start of this talk. And for performance and efficiency, in some systems, your writes might not propagate to all replicas immediately. The classic problem being, if you uh, then try to read what you just wrote and arrive at a different replica, you might see stale data. So some researchers have proposed using baggage to verify up-to-date reads by carrying causal timestamps with executions. So second-generation cross-cutting tools have uh, some exciting directions, touching on many different aspects of understanding and enforcing distributed system behaviors. Some of my further work uh, in this area has moved this vision forward by factoring out that end-to-end -end context um, as a uh, sort of general purpose component of distributed systems. And I'll be presenting that work in, uh, in April. So just taking a step back, uh, these cross-cutting tools are one of several lines of research that I've looked at during my PhD. I've worked on both the tools themselves and on abstractions and designs that underpin second-generation tools. Another theme in my research has been resource management. Uh, in addition to the cross-cutting tool retro, I've also explored in more depth uh, some of the management and scheduling challenges that come up in distributed systems, in multi-tenant systems specifically. And a final uh, theme has been scalability, which is one of the open challenges still faced by many first-generation cross-cutting tools. My research in this space has centered on how to collect and analyze large volumes of end-to-end -end performance data. So just looking to the, uh, looking to the future briefly, um, my ongoing work will focus on several strata, some of it related to cross-cutting tools and some of it taking a broader perspective. So I am, of course, interested in the underlying abstractions and mechanisms that are common to different cross-cutting tools with the idea of embedding some principal components in our system at development time to let us deploy these various tasks at runtime. There are non-trivial uh, logistical challenges associated with deploying tools like this uh, because you have to touch every component of your distributed system. Um, this is actually the biggest obstacle to deploying tools like these in practice today. Um, and third is uh, exploring new use cases for cross-cutting tools like those that I illustrated a moment ago. But beyond cross-cutting tools, another strata that appeals to me is in applying machine learning. So distributed systems generate a wealth of performance information. But to date, there's really been limited success in gleaning insights from this data beyond looking at specific problems. In part, this is because the data is very noisy, it's very rich, unstructured, and heterogeneous, and exploring this kind of data set is very difficult. But with the advent and success of modern machine learning techniques, um, I believe that we can make significant gains here. There is a great potential for embedding machine learning models within our systems, as I know many of you are exploring. Um, so in my mind, we use heuristics all over the place within distributed systems. And uh, these are exactly the kind of things that machine learning has shown us can do a better task than whatever developers come up with. Um, and a final topic is in um, exploration and even visualization. Um, so in my talk, I sort of used a lot of diagrams to illustrate some of the concepts of my work. But of course, these are uh, gross simplifications of the kind of data that actually exists in, in real life. Um, so imagine being an engineer or an operator of these systems and uh, having to look at data sets that comprise billions of these end-to-end -end traces, each uh, differing subtly in the order of that events happen and um, the failures that can occur. So imagine querying such a data set, browsing it, uh, trying to find or describe similarities or differences or well, yeah. So this sort of thing is, is, is a nightmare. Um, and it touches on how to visualize, query, explore, summarize, store, and process large volumes of performance data. So at this point, we've reached the end of my talk. And if only one thing sticks with you, I hope that it's this cross-cutting perspective of distributed systems. Before I finish, I would be remiss not to mention my, the excellent collaborators that I've had over the years including Peter Bodek, who's sitting in the room, and uh, Madan Musavati, who is uh, definitely watching the talk. Um, and with that, thank you very much for your attention. All right. more questions. Uh, I know a lot of you are meeting in one-on-one, -on -one, but yeah. there are questions that spilled over from during the talk. 
or any questions, we can take them now. Great. I'll ask, um, uh, you know, I'm interested in hardware software co-design, and, mm. and I'm seeing more and more decisions about resource management being pushed into hardware, into mm -hmm. proprietary hardware that might have limited visibility and limited yeah. mechanisms to take action. How do you see that fitting into these sort of cross-cutting systems? So I, I guess there are two potential challenges here. The first is the fact that, it, that decisions are being made in hardware, and the second is the fact that they're proprietary black boxes. <coughs> um, the latter of these is something that I'm, uh, at the hardware level, I don't have anything to say other than I hope that they're not black boxes. Um, at the software level, there are certain things that you might be able to do with black box software components um, that uh, I actually consider to be one of the future directions that I want to work on. So the, that question of the deployment challenges associated with some of these tools essentially come down to how much effort do you want, do you have, do you ask someone to expend to deploy this tool? And uh, if that effort is zero, then you're essentially doing something you're treating the system as a black box. Um, now, the, the flip side of this at the hardware level, one of the things that comes out of something like pivot tracing or, or, or even retro, the data that we need them to propagate is actually very simple and very small. So retro's tenant ID, for example, is a you know, fixed, fixed width 32-bit integer. And it's not unreasonable to ask, uh, ask for this to be incorporated at the hardware level in which case you would essentially be able to plug in whatever decisions are being made by the hardware to these higher level tasks. Um, and bridging, say, the network with the application level uh, with some of these tools is, uh, is a pretty exciting direction to go, I think. Uh, cool. Okay, well, All right. No more questions. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you very much.